to rehabilitate their heart after heart attack, they were losing weight lickety-split, faster than we could explain. So that started my research into what makes your body build fat, what makes your body lose fat, and the revelation was very surprising. It's not what you think it is. It's not about calories. It's not about... Calories have some influence, of course, but it's not the predominant factor. It's not the way you win that game. The problem with cutting back on calories is in that you lower your metabolism, and it's like chasing your own tail. You don't get anywhere. What you have to do is you have to convince your body that you don't need fat. That's the key. And what we have with Pace Express is a system of exerting yourself that tells your body that fat is of no utility for that. We have a system of eating that tells your body that you do not need fat. Why would you waste the energy storing fat if your body is convinced you're going to eat well again tomorrow? Fat is a starvation survival strategy. You put on fat when your body thinks you're under duress. What we've done in the Western world is we've mimicked starvation with the nutrient content of our food. The macronutrient especially, that's your protein, carbohydrate, and fat ratio. So you'll be hearing a little bit about that at the end. It's not complicated, it's very simple. You're going to be given very specific instructions on what to eat, how to make your body believe it does not need to store fat. Mainly what we're focusing on today is the activity level the exertion that you're going to do to convince your body that fat is of no utility. So that's new to you, right? Yes. Yeah. You've, you've not heard about an exertion program that tells your body that fat is no good. What we're trying to do is we're trying to train your body, teach your body, coach your body in the right direction. I want you to get rid of all of those negative thoughts about forcing your body to do anything. All that negative thought process about dieting, which is all about a process of denial. You don't need to do any of that. You need to do the opposite. You need to convince your body that times are good. That has the wonderful advantage that it feels good. You're not going to have to go through hard times. You're only going to exert yourself for a very, very brief period of time, and that actually is enjoyable. That's something we are built to do naturally. Your native instincts will come back. That whole thing about long duration cardio to lose fat, it's again like cutting calories. You're chasing your own tail. Let me explain what I mean by that. If what you do is you do a moderate level of exertion, the way that we've been taught to do, cardio, cardiovascular endurance training, what happens is that you can only fuel that with fat. If you exert yourself for a prolonged period of time, fat is the only fuel you have that can sustain that level of exertion. Do you all understand that? Yeah. You've got fast, high energy output systems like glycogen, creatine, ATP. Those things are stored in the muscle. They've got nothing to do with fat. They produce a very high energy output. It's your high-octane fuel for your body. The problem is, it's a very limited duration. You can't sustain activity for more than a few minutes with that. So when you do a prolonged activity, like jogging for 45 minutes, you have to burn fat. We've been told that was a good thing. That was a huge mistake. When you train your body to burn fat, think about it. What is that teaching your body? You can't, you can't declare war on your body. You, you can't beat it into submission. It doesn't work. You've got to treat your body as if you're its coach. And you're, you're teaching and training and leading it to do the right thing. If what you're doing is you're doing 45 minutes of continuous duration, your body says, well, it's a good thing I had the fat. That was the only way I could feel that. So the next time you eat, it gets to work to prepare you for that activity even better next time, which means converting a larger percentage of the calories that you consume towards body fat. So if you're running a long distance every day, you get away with that for a while because as much as your body is building fat, you're burning it back in the next exercise session. 
but God help you when you quit. Because you've trained your body repeatedly to build more and more fat. So that's the experience we all have. We have an instinct for that. We've all played around with that enough, right? Yeah. You notice that, yeah, you know, you'll lose the weight when you go out and do that jogging, but when you quit, you get fatter than when you started, and your body looks worse. Because now you've burned off fat, you've burned off muscle, rather, and you've replaced it with fat. So now you've got these love handles and big belly that come on in two weeks of stopping the running. And eventually, everybody stops running. You can't keep doing that forever. It's too stressful on the low extremities. It's not natural. We did not do that in our native environment. We would have ran from a predator or run short distances to catch our prey or fought off the clan next door. But if we would have run for a long distance, that meant that something was terribly wrong in our environment. You don't do that during normal good times. You do that when the volcano goes off next door and you're at war, <laughs> or there's a famine and you're moving to a new territory. So your body interprets that as extreme duress. You secrete the hormone cortisol. It burns up your muscle. It shrinks your internal organs. It puts off all maintenance and repair. You can't be building new tissue when you're running from a pack of wolves. So what we do when we, when we do that long duration is we turn off repair mechanisms. So when you have all that trauma on your extremities, your body interprets long duration as stress. It's only a matter of time until every nidus of inflammation becomes a major problem. Running will break you down and make you old before your time. So what we've devised is an exact opposite system. You're never going to exercise for duration. You're never going to do anything long enough that fat is of any utility. Not only is fat a low burn fuel, you can't get much energy fast out of it, but it's also a slow start fuel. If you exercise quickly, fat can't catch up. It takes a while to gear up. That's why they've taught you you need to exercise for at least 20 minutes to burn fat. They just never picked up on the idea that you're not getting the benefit of exercise during exercise. You get the benefit of exercise from the adaptive response that your body keys in. The adaptive response to prepare you for that same activity when you do it next time. By repeating the same activity over and over, you're training, coaching your body to make some changes in your physiology and your anatomy. We all understand that important principle. You're not going to beat your body into anything. You're going to cooperate with your body. You're going to use your body's natural instincts. You're, you're designed to react to certain stimuli. We're just going to push those buttons for you. When you do that, you find out it's a whole lot easier. It's a whole lot more enjoyable. So you're never going to exercise for a long period of time. Your body will get the message, why should I build fat? All this fat that I have was a waste of time. I need to get to work to prepare me for the challenge that I'm having. So what's that challenge going to be? It's going to be very brief. You're really only exerting yourself strenuously for about a minute at a time. Does that sound better to you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so they're, 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 when, you're, when you're training, when you're forcing your body to change, you do have to have some will. I mean, I won't try to disguise that. You will have to, to use your strength of will to make a decision that you want your body to change and then use your activity to, to coach your body to make that change. But you'll only be uncomfortable for 30 to 90 seconds doing that. So here's the basic program. It's called Pace Express. It's, I've been using Pace for, we've got maybe 40 or 50,000 people doing some version of Pace. This is a brand new version of Pace that we created specifically for this group called Pace Express. We're taking all the best things about the Pace program. I've written four books on the subject. I've published uh, several hundred articles on it. But this is a version that we're accelerating results by giving you kind of the fast track approach to it. So PAY stands for Progressively Accelerating Cardiopulmonary Exertion. I know there's a lot of pearl handled words in there, but you really don't have to understand all of that concept to make it work. 
You only just have to follow along with, with uh, Rob, and we're going to be giving you a, a DVD on your second week that's going to show you what to do when you're not with him. And those principles are employed in, in the actual workouts. The principles are progressivity. What that means simply is that you make little incremental changes in your program over time. All exercise is only effective if you have some changes in the exercise program. What's important is what you decide to change. But anyone who's, who say, um, lifted weights, you do understand that you can't go to the gym and lift the same weight forever. You'll make a little bit of gains during the first couple of weeks, then your body will plateau. And unless you increase the resistance or increase the reps, change the program, your body's already made the adaptive response it's going to make. So in order for any exercise program to be effective, you have to continuously, incrementally change something. In this case, what we want the progressive element to be is the level of exertion. So we're going to give you things that challenge your metabolic rate, the amount of oxygen that you can get. Challenge your lungs, challenge your heart, to get the, the oxygenated blood out to the tissue, and challenge the metabolism of how fast you can get energy. So if you think about what I said about trying to train your body that it doesn't need fat, and fat is a slow burn fuel, you understand why that's what we want to make the program, that's why we want to make the program focus on that? Because if you can only get low energy out of fat, what we're going to make the most important part of the program, that is the element that you incrementally increase over time as you become more conditioned, we're going to make that the amount of oxygen that you can get per time, the, the horsepower of your whole metabolic engine. When we train that, we're training in the opposite direction of what fat is good for. You understand? We're going to force your body over time to pay attention to what it is that you're trying to teach it. It's by progressively, incrementally increasing the metabolic rate that you're exerting during the exertion period, you're going to force your body to pay attention to, hey, I have a new challenge here. I have to now make some adaptive response. What adaptive response do I need to make when the changing parameter of the exercise is the intensity level? It can't be building fat. It's going to say, I got to get rid of that fat because it's only providing low energy output and I'm being challenged for high energy output. So I better convert that fat to glycogen, creatine, and ATP stored in the muscle. Those things are what you want. For one thing, they don't exist in the fat, they exist in the lean body tissue, and those will be measured in that body composition thing you've had measured today. They will be measured as lean tissues. So you're telling your body the fat tissue is of no good for what challenge you're under. You need to convert to lean tissue. When you do that, it has the added advantage that you're going to feel great. Because fat is a slow burn energy, you feel that. You feel sluggish when you're dependent on fat for fuel. When you have ATP ready to go on an instant, on demand, you feel energetic. It's what we have when we are younger, and it's what we have less of as we age. As we age, our bodies are gradually converted to fat more so in the Western world than in other cultures that I visited and compared. Mostly because we have taught ourselves through our lack of high intensity exercise and our diet that, that mimics starvation, that fat is the best fuel for us. So it's part of the reason that as we age in this country, we get so lethargic. You, you feel that inhibition of being able to get high energy output rapidly available on the land. So the second principle I told you about was acceleration. In addition to incrementally increasing the intensity of the challenge, you're going to make that challenge come a little bit faster as you become more conditioned. 
When you are deconditioned, it's going to take several minutes for your metabolism to gear up. But you're going to train as you become more conditioned to do that faster. That has the added advantage of creating more stored energy in high energy output systems that will make that high energy instantaneously available on demand. Why would we want to do that? There's one big reason. As you store more energy as glycogen, which is available in a fraction of a second, as soon as you need it, it's calorically expensive to create. Your body would prefer to store it as fat because it's cheap metabolically. It takes a lot more energy to create stored energy in glycogen. Where is that energy going to come from? From your stored body fat. So as we accelerate that challenge through it, you're going to, your body will get the message, I need more stored energy available faster, more instantaneously available on demand. It takes 25 times more calories to maintain a pound of glycogen than it does to maintain a pound of fat. Fat is relatively inert. So it's part of the reason that our metabolic rate goes down with age, because we depend more and more on stored body fat. We're going to reverse that process. It will allow you to eat normally again. You'll be able to eat more without gaining weight because your metabolic rate will go up. So we do this with short bursts of progressively increasing intensity exertion that become not longer because you're more conditioned, but shorter. So as you go through this program, and graduates of it, like myself, my wife, we can do our PACE program in six minutes. We still get the same benefit because our bodies have been trained to have this high energy output fuel available. So in the way that nature intended, you will be able to exert yourself quickly on demand. If you think about it, when you're in the wild, and that's, that's how we, our bodies are still built, you don't tell that saber-toothed tiger, wait a minute, I've got to go stretch and I've got to warm up. You have to accelerate to 100% of your maximum capacity in a heart rate, in a heartbeat, or you're, you're somebody else's meal. So there's those two principles. And the last part of PACE, cardiopulmonary exertion, just means that you can choose any kind of activity that will give your heart and lungs a challenge, give your metabolic rate a challenge. The way we have mostly practiced this program in the past is that we would have um, patients come in and see me and we would individualize their program. They would be told according to their level of fitness, we do uh, an assessment of body composition like you had and we test their, their heart and lung. And then we tell them exactly what to do step by step. Um, what we have learned from that is that you can use something like running and something like interval training if you are sufficiently fit to begin with. But for the rest of us, you can't just tell people to go out and do high intensity intervals. What you need is you need a system to get them to the capacity to be able to exert themselves at high intensity. And that's what PACE is all about. So it works for everyone. We've had people who were 350 pounds, over 50% body fat. We have people that were so deconditioned, they could hardly even walk. I've even given exercise programs for people who couldn't walk, people in wheelchairs. Everyone can do it because it, it starts at whatever level of fitness you're at. And then it incrementally, a little bit at a time, increases the intensity while keeping the duration brief. So those are the basic principles. You won't have to, to really understand uh, how to apply that. All you will have to do is have faith that it is based on this new concept that really works and follow along with, with Rob as he teaches you how to do it. Now, um, I do want to tell you a little bit about uh, the eating plan. Um, you will be getting some basic rules of how to teach your metabolism that times are good. In the same way your exercise is going to teach you 
Teach your body that you don't need fat, you need this expensive to maintain, high caloric maintenance, high output energy form. You're also going to, through your consumption, teach your body that it needs not, need not worry that there is a famine down the road. What we are doing is we're mimicking starvation as if all the game are gone. We're, we're living on, on bark and, and berries and tubers and whatever low nutrient food we can scrounge so that there's winter coming. That's the time we need to store fat. What you're gonna do is swing that pendulum in the opposite direction. You're gonna eat a diet, uh, an eating plan that tells your body times are good. High nutrient density, low carbohydrate, high protein, right kind of fat. So if we were living in, a, in our native world, you really wouldn't need any kind of intervention. One of the things I write about when I talk about the, the doctor's diet cure is that we all need to stop dieting. It starts from the basic premise that here in modern day America, if you define dieting as deviation from your natural eating, we are all dieting from the day we are born. We can prove from fetal blood samples that a baby's metabolism is messed up, headed for diabetes before they're born. We are born into this mess where our diet is so deviated from what we were designed to eat that we are all on this extreme diet. Unless the light's getting fatigued. <laughs> so what we're going to do is teach you all how to stop dieting and return to your native eating. Again, that has the, the wonderful side effect that you don't have to deny yourself tasty food. I write that I really only have two rules of eating. And one is that you only eat foods that you like. That, that derives from my own personal slant on things. I'm not eating something I don't like. I don't care who says it's good for me. <laughs> if I don't like it, I'm interpreting that, that is not good for me. Why would nature make us so that our taste buds are our own worst enemy? You should be able to eat what you enjoy eating. But you have to do that within the confines of the second rule, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, is you have to eat foods that are natural, foods that would have been native, foods that are, were available to us as our bodies were being built the way they are now. And, and that, is, that is the crux of it. That is the issue that we are born with. We are presented with a wholly different kind of food. We were, we were built for one world, and we have now created for ourselves another. And that's the issue. So, so there will be some basic rules about how you're going to reverse that process and mimic eating your native eating plan in the modern world. There are three basic rules to do that. Number one is you're going to eat protein first. We're going to have a little bit of a, a crash course for you, which I don't think any of you have been told about yet, uh, for the first few days, where you're going to eat this kind of in its extreme form to kind of jumpstart the process. The first rule of native, natural return of healthy metabolism is to teach your body that hunting is good, the game is plentiful. Again, why would your body convert energy to store body fat if you're going to eat again tomorrow? That's, that's of no utility. Um, why would it make you so fat that you can't catch the game? Um, it's not, fat is not just about calories consumed, but about your body's interpretation of your environment. How it expects your environment to affect you tomorrow. If it thinks your environment is poor, it thinks you need fat for survival. If it thinks your environment is good, it will take those same calories that you consume and do other things that are also useful. It takes energy, it takes metabolic energy for you to build new muscle. It takes metabolic energy for you to lay down bone, for you to, to strengthen collagen, 
for you to have your immune system run around and gobble up all those bad guys and protect you from infection takes a lot of energy. Where is that in the formula, calories consumed uh, minus calories burned equals uh, weight gain and weight loss? It depends on how you determine to use those calories. First rule is eat protein first. You're going to consume more protein than your body actually needs for maintenance. <clears throat> that signals to your body, times are good. It will then liberalize on the burning of calories. And you need to do that first so that then it gets the message that when you consume good quality nutrient food, that can afford to take those calories and do those kind of maintenance features. And we're going to be building new tissue as you burn off that fat. The second rule is about carbohydrates. What we've changed in the modern world more than anything else is we've doubled the amount of carbohydrate that we consume. And again, in a native world, that mimics bad times. That's what we would have eaten when our primary food source had dried up. So when you do that continuously, like we do in modern day America, we're always on the verge of winter. We're always preparing for famine. So you're gonna lower your carbohydrate intake. And then we've got a list for you. I don't want to get too technical, but, but we judge the quality of the carbohydrate with something called glycemic index and glycemic load, and you're gonna get a list of how to apply that to you. And then the third rule is to eat the right kind of fat. Unfortunately, we don't need too much fat in the modern world as, as they've mistakenly told us in the past. We, I've seen lots of hunter-gatherer societies that consume a lot more fat than we do, up to 70% of their calories from fat, and they're universally needy. You can eat fat, it's not a problem, but you have to choose the right kind of fat. The fat that we eat in the modern world is inflammatory. If we, we feed the animals the wrong thing, Cows are made to eat grass, not grains, and we feed them corn and soy, and the animals are inflamed. They produce the wrong kind of body fat. And then we've been eating that wrong kind of body fat at an extreme excess, and it causes our bodies not only to be inflamed, but to, to progress towards heart disease and diabetes. So it's a good health-enhancing thing. And in order for us to tell your body that's okay, to liberalize your metabolism so that it will start to burn calories again, it's got to also get rid of some of that inflammatory fat. That inflammation tells it that, that it needs to clamp down. There's, there's trouble ahead. So you're going to eat the right kind of fat, which basically means higher omega-3s, lower omega-6s. You can eat red meat if you like red meat. You don't have to eat it as part of the diet. But if you choose red meat, you need to choose according to some basic rules. There's some things in your, in your handout information. So you see, the, the, the big picture is that it takes only 12 minutes a day. And during those 12 minutes, you're only going to be exerting yourself for an exertion period, then a rest period. Exertion period again, a rest period again, and then a third exertion period. So 12 minutes total, but part of that time you're going to be resting, and during the first exertion period, the first set, you're really just going to be warming up. The second one, you're going to be kind of ramping up in that intermediate zone, and then in the third one, you're going to be going for a peak challenge. This is all about every, every day that you exercise, hitting some peak challenge. From what I told you about what fat is for and what ATP and creatine do, you understand that, right? Does everybody get it? Yes. So if what you're doing is you only just need to tell your body that you need a higher energy output, duration doesn't matter. You don't have to exercise for a, a, a specified period of time at that high level of output. It's kind of analogous to what we do when we, when we tell athletes to build strength. To build strength in something, you really don't have to figure how long they've got to do it. If you've got a power lifter and, and he wants to maximize his clean and jerk, how does he do it? By practicing the same movement for, for 60 or 90 minutes over and over? No. 
So he's never going to build strength that way. He's got to ramp up to using more and more weight until each week he tries to add a pound or two. And in that way, he's training for strength. What we're doing for you is we're training for strength and power of your metabolic system. We want to ramp it up. So it's only important that you achieve that high rate of metabolic output for an instant. Everything else is just wrapping up. That's the beauty of the program. You just ramp up to this one instant of very high output. So we're gonna have heart rate monitors for you. We're gonna teach you how to monitor your own heart rate. We're gonna teach you how to monitor your respiratory rate and a general feeling of how hard you're working. Because as you get used to this program, you're gonna be focused on, okay, how hard am I working now? And how much um, do I have left? And just being sure that each person in this room Every time that you exert yourself, every day of exercise, you try to hit some new peak. You don't go willy-nilly, and you don't go out and start sprinting immediately when you're peak conditioned, but every day you're making one little step in that direction. So that day by day, your, your body gets the message it needs high energy output systems, low energy output stored in fat, is of no use. It's very much more specific than just going out and burning calories anyway. And it's a whole lot more effect effective than burning calories at a low rate, like going out and jogging when you're teaching your body that the fuel system you need for that is fat. So because of that, you lose fat a lot faster. You all will lose body fat, but in excess of the amount of body, uh, amount of weight you lose, you will lose pounds of fat. Because at the same time, you're burning off the fat, you're converting that to lean energy storage. So you, you might, for instance, over this uh, uh, program of six weeks, typical is to may, maybe lose um, uh, 15 pounds. A lot of people have lost a lot more, but take that as a, a pretty reasonable goal. But in those people who lost 15 pounds, many of them lost 25 pounds of body fat, which is, when you think about it, an amazing rate. To, to lose that much body fat actually exceeds what is supposed to be possible when you look at the textbooks. We had people, I think our, our record is 66 pounds of body fat. In what length time? In, in six weeks. Well, our record for total body fat loss is we had, we had someone who was um, 320 pounds and 50% body fat go down to, um, the end result was 6% body fat. We have a, a person in the program now that started off uh, so deconditioned, she couldn't even walk on a treadmill. Uh, the first time I put her on a treadmill, her heart rate went up to 140, and 20 minutes later, it was still up there. So I knew I couldn't, I couldn't do that with her anymore. <laughs> so we started with just very gentle walks outside at a slow pace for 45 seconds at a time. She started only by walking 45 seconds and resting. She has now lost, uh, is Jackie here? Do you, do you know how much? Yeah, she's now, she started at 55% body fat, she's now 18% body fat. And I, and I think she has lost a, a, about 75 pounds of fat. And she started by walking. And even if, throughout all of that program, she has never exercised more than 20 minutes, and she's averaged only 12 minutes a day. So I think that's the basic uh, principles. Again, I don't, I don't want you to feel intimidated by all of that science. We have that built into the program. And, and uh, PACE is a, a patented trademark system that uh, the US Patent Office thought was unique enough to give me a patent on it. And uh, we have used it for great success. Uh, so I know it's gonna work. Now, I'm very excited about this new, this new twist on it. So we're going to give you a little bit faster, a little bit faster approach to it.
I think we have we have time for questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody got a question? Back here. Yes, ma'am.
And then the answer to your second question, what makes Pace Express different, is we've incorporated a new principle that I've been learning about recently. And that is that we're trying to get your heart and lungs challenged it as quickly as possible because that's what challenges your metabolism, your metabolic rate. But we've learned that there are only certain exercises that can do that. You know, to be able to really get you pant so that you develop an oxygen gap. You can do that with running, bicycling, you know, you have to use your whole body. But we've learned this principle of muscle sequencing that we can use a much wider variety of exercises, exertions, if we sequence the muscles that you use. Because if you were to just try to, say, get your heart and lungs challenged by, by doing uh, squats, you're gonna just do, say, deep knee bends. Your, quad, your quadricep muscles are gonna fatigue, and they'll get tired to where you can't do it anymore, and your heart and lungs may only be moderate challenge at that point. But if we then follow that with now you're doing jumping jacks, you're not using your quads anymore. You're using the uh, adductors, the lateral movement of the upper hill. And then we follow that immediately with, um, say, uh, uh, push-ups, where you're not using those muscles, you're using your upper body, your chest and arms, that because of that sequencing of different muscles through that triad, we can more effectively challenge your heart and lungs. It makes the whole program work faster. That's, that's the new principle that's in uh, Pace Express. And, and Rob will be t talking to you about that all the time as he's training you. He's gonna be telling you how you're using that principle of, of, of muscle sequencing to make sure you get a challenge, even though individual muscle groups are showing you fatigue. Yes? Um, a lot of people I hear are opposed to the dairy saying that it creates excess mucus in the body. And um, I saw cheese and stuff like that on your list, so what's your take on that? Excellent question. In, in, if you really want to be strict about following what is completely native, dairy would have no place. Okay. Because you can think about it in a native environment, you're not going to be you know, able to go chase a, a water buffalo and obtain a milk from it. So that's a very new addition to us. Right? We didn't have domesticated animals before about 10,000 years ago. So most of us are still designed uh, to, to uh, live off of other food. For many people, the casein in milk presents an allergy. For other people, the, lacto the lactose sugar in it. Uh, for people of African descent in particular, very small percentage uh, have the enzyme lactase to be able to digest milk. All of those things combined to make it um, somewhat antibody stimulating. I think a good rule of thumb is if you've used dairy products and you're used to them and they don't present a problem for you, you can do it in moderation in this program. We want to focus on the most important elements and dairy is, after all, a good source of vitamin D and a good source of protein. Uh, and as long as you're getting high protein, right kind of fat, low carbohydrate, it will work. But for general health, dairy is not the best thing. Where does beverages like wine fall in this? Like pure wine. I don't drink coffee or anything like that. I, it's not uh, excluded from what you can, gotcha. you can use. <laughs> we try to measure Did everybody hear that? Index. No. <laughs> I think we, you'll like to hear that. <laughs> we tried to measure the glycemic index on wine, and we found that you know you have to consume 100 grams of carbohydrate and then measure the uh, blood sugar and compare that blood sugar to 100 grams of straight sugar, and that's where you get the ratio to calculate the glycemic index. We couldn't give people 100 grams of, of, of dry wine, because by the time they get 100 grams of carbohydrate, they're too intoxicated. <laughs> so I don't think it's a big issue in moderation. Yes? I was really excited to hear you say that you eat the foods you like, because what I struggle with is I'm particular. There's like a lot of food I just don't eat. There's a lot of things I just don't eat. And so, in, in looking at that and hearing you say, don't eat stuff that you don't like. <laughs> so, I think 
Has that been a struggle for people, or is it really designed that you're not forced to kind of eat things you just? You're going to be getting some basic rules that if you apply those, you, you should have enough latitude that you can find, find plenty of foods that you enjoy. There is one caveat to that, though, and you need to appreciate that part of what you like is influenced by your previous habits. And we've been brought up in a world where we were exposed to a lot of unnatural foods that you may develop the habit of eating that you may have to use your conscious intelligence now to say, wait a minute, that's not a natural food. I'm going to find something else I like because that's not uh, something that I would have um, eaten in a native environment. A good example is all the, the grain products that we eat. If you find grain in nature, you would have nothing to do with it. You try to eat uh, wheat, it's going to taste horrible, it's going to be hard to swallow, and it's going to give you a bellyache, and you're never going to touch it again. But what we did is we violated that natural arrangement by having mechanisms, industry come along, break open that grain, and then worse, we made it taste like things we like. You like things that are salty for good reason. The salty foods that occur in nature are good for you. You like things that are sweet for good reason. It tells you when the fruit is ripe. And, and sweet things in nature are always good for you. I can't think of a one, one naturally occurring fat that's not good for you. We like fatty foods for good reason. It means there's a lot of good fat-soluble vitamins in those things, and they're hard to come by, by in the environment. You have a preference for that for a good reason. Where we get into trouble is we take something like grain that you wouldn't want to touch in a native environment, and we use industry to fool ourselves. We add salt, we add fat, we add sugar to make that taste like something that if it were in your native environment, you would like. So I'm just saying you've got to be aware of that, that don't let uh, Procter & Gamble and Kellogg pull that one on you. That, that you need to, to be eating things that are native that you like. And that's, that's the issue. But there should be plenty of them. Yes? Okay, so you said for the protein, that would be the morning too? You must have protein foods. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. For protein, just so we would be starting proteins um, that would adjust these proteins to be more protein. protein. Yes. Would that be kind of like a breakfast? Yes. Um, breakfast is the most important meal, and it's most important that you start off with protein in the morning. You are breaking your fast. That's how it gets its name. So you haven't eaten for 12 hours or so. Your metabolism is prime. You can have the biggest influence on how your body interprets the environment for that day by making sure that you eat plenty of protein for breakfast. We have a supplement for you. They're, they're not getting that yet, all right? No. You, you will be getting a, a supplement that's going to boost your protein. Well, that question, um, the quick express, the first week of the program, <coughs> That yes, that's another important. element of getting protein first. In addition to getting protein in the morning, as you initiate the program, you're, you're going to be eating higher protein at the very beginning of it to convince your body that times are good. Then when you do other things, other steps, it will be, get the message that it can afford to use those high nutrients or can afford to get rid of fat. And one more thing. So okay. Yes, it does. And then we'll be giving you, in addition to what's in the book, we're going to be giving you a separate handout that we don't have yet in the beginning on Tuesday that gives you uh, the basic rules of the eating plan. And also, um, just so you know, on Tuesday, you're going to get a quick start meal plan that's a real basic seven-day approach to kind of like flushing a lot of this crap out of your body so that you can really kickstart this, and you'll get that all that on Tuesday. You're going to get a whole lot of stuff on Tuesday. So I highly suggest you make it to class Tuesday. <laughs> yes? How does this exercise affect the appearance of the satellite? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a question. Uh, I hope you get a chance to talk to Yadi. She's uh, my trainer who's coming in uh, tonight. But that is very much her specialty. She's written a book on it. If you have more interest, we can make it available to you. Uh, but uh, cellulite's a, a tough one. Uh, it is more dependent on percentage body fat than anything else. 
So the thing that you can do to minimize cellulite most is to lower your body fat, which is exactly what this program is, is, is intended to address. Yes? Two questions. What happens to the extra skin? And I mean, you noticed in your um, previous cases, Absolutely. High blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, the, the topic of my first book, are all consequences of the same thing. It's this abnormal environment that's causing that constellation of modern disease. This is the cure. It's not to take a drug. It's uh, not to uh, uh, have surgery. It's to fix the environmental things that cause it. And the same things that will make you lean also lower your blood pressure and lower your risk of diabetes and heart disease. And this is very much uh, specific for that. As a matter of fact, I said I developed the exercise program uh, to rehabilitate injured hearts. I developed most of the components of the, the PACE uh, dietary eating plan to address those issues. Because uh, that's my specialty in my clinic, is people come to me with high blood pressure, heart disease, have heart attacks and strokes, have diabetes, and we reverse it all. It's all reversible with uh, this kind of approach. Yes, sir. Uh, have you done any like studies as far as people that have the program for like, years or whatever? What sort of percentage, like after the 12 weeks, you know, how hard is it to maintain and how many people stick with it or fall back and end up on the weight back on? The, the, the short answer is I have what I call category C evidence. When I speak at scientific conferences, if we've been able to publish the data and it's peer reviewed, it's category A. Category B is inference from published uh, studies. And category C is internal data and self-published data. I have a lot of that in category C. Uh, the, the percentage, though, varies by a lot of different uh, parameters. Uh, it depends on what you're calling uh, success, how much uh, fat loss, how much change in body composition is your, your marking point. But in general, I can tell you this is far more effective than the 10 years I spent previously using more conventional methods. We get a much faster rate of fat loss, we get a much faster resolution of other health problems, and we get a, a much greater uh, percentage of maintenance. Part of the reason for that, I think, is this is not very uh, tough on your system. You, you don't feel like you're being denied, so you get a much higher compliance rate. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I have some questions as well. Uh, what is your opinion on um, cooking with, you know, natural oils like olive oil? And um, after the 12 weeks are up, will you be giving us specific techniques to maintain? Uh, the answer to the first question is, uh, yeah, oil is very important. In general, you want to follow that litmus test that I've been talking about. If it's natural, native, it's probably good. If it's man-made, it's probably bad. So vegetables don't come with oils that you could use. So all vegetable oil is a man-made creation and a huge mistake. Olive oil is much easier, and you don't need that trying to steel press machinery to be able to get oil out of it. We've used it for much longer, it's much more natural. You can't cook at high heat in olive oil, though. But there is a list in the handout that you got of the preferred oils. It gives them to you by category and tells you the oils that you prefer for cooking. The answer to your um, second question is yes. We would like for all of you to continue to be uh, involved. After the first six-week period, uh, we, we want to repeat it. After that, we want as many as possible to just keep following it. And we want to keep tracking it as much as possible. Um, I haven't had time to really look through it, but I see menus of, of things that you recommended to eat and all that stuff. And a lot of that, I see stuff that, that I don't really care for. So is somewhere in the information you've given us, or that you will be given us, things that we can equate to that and replace instead of? And I understand Absolutely. why some of these things are good, because just from my own research. Absolutely. I would, I would share that exactly. If somebody handed that to me, I'd say, well, wait a minute, what about if I don't like this thing? Um, and that's just, um, that, those are examples for me. Because okay. some are, of it's costly, and of course, you know, I'm Yes, they, they are intended to illustrate 
how you can use the principles to create a meal plan and, and give you recipes for those of you who want to use it. But you will be getting on Tuesday a more generalized approach on how to use these rules to pick the own, your own foods that you like. Okay, unfortunately right now, we've got to kind of wrap this up because there are some people on some tight timetables. Dr. Sears, are, are you on a timetable? Can you stay and talk to a few of these people? I can a stay. Bit? You want to just do it informally while you Yeah, can. so anybody that can kind of hang right now, that's, that's great. And, you know, he's happy to answer questions. And then what we'll do.